Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrell Podcast, Season 10, Episode 6. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us, Steelers Nation. And Dave, we're just going to jump right into the news because I don't think it's appropriate to even have some sort of banter to begin this. And I wish it was obviously a better story, but the the sad news that just came across the other day with wide receivers coach Daryl Drake dead at 62. Dave, he was well-liked, well-respected, a heck of a coach who taught so many great players, uh, gone suddenly and, and gone far too soon. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, 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 you know, it was shocking for sure. I mean, look, you never know, right? Uh, you, mm-hmm. you, you just never know. Life is very, very uh, short enough as it is. Uh, and, and, you know, for this to happen out of the blue like this and, you know, the reaction uh, from, from, from the players throughout the last couple of days uh, really lets you know the kind of the kind of person that uh, right. that that Daryl Drake was, and and the teacher that he was, obviously had the full respect. I mean, even you know former players of his, Larry Fitzgerald, Devin Hester, uh, Darius Hayward Bay, of course, who is now a a uh, a former player as well too. So uh, a big big loss uh, for for the team, and and you know uh, for those young wide receivers specifically uh, in that room, and how much he meant to them, and you know they'll have to now try to regroup and and. And, and, you know, make make him v- very proud of them moving forward. I'm sure they will. Absolutely. And just I want to be specific with the news came across early Sunday morning. The team confirmed um, the team canceled Sunday's practice. They canceled Monday's training camp practice. They're going to push that to Tuesday. Uh, we're recording this on, on Monday night if you haven't picked up on that by now. But, yeah, I mean, I think you, you see all the, the outpouring of support, you know, from, from different teams, organizations, from – John Harbaugh talking about how his dad knew him so well, to Larry Fitzgerald, to Devin Hester, to Heinz Ward, who he coached at Georgia. Um, I mean, just the, the, the just the scope of how many players were, were impacted by him. And not only, as you said, professionally, but personally, spiritually, very spiritual man, Daryl Drake was, has a, a wife, three kids. I can't even imagine what they're going through right now. But, um, you know, the best you can hope for is for the team to rally around that. You know, guys like Juju and, and Dante Moncrief really have to step up even more and become leaders in that in that wide receiver room. But you're just looking for the whole team to rally around the Drake family and then each other to try to get past this. It won't be easy. It's going to take a whole lot of time. Drake was – I mean, when, when Richard Mann retired, you know, it was going to be so tough to try to fill those shoes because Mann was just a legend. And I think – Drake was the perfect replacement from that aspect where they were pretty similar guys, longevity, everybody respected, everyone knew that they would command the room. So, you know, you just hope that everyone can kind of, like I said, rally around that and, and try to get through this the best they can. Yeah, and, you know, I'm sure they'll push push through this, and it's good that they had a good you know couple of days off here uh, mm-hmm. to, to uh, reflect and get their, get their mind right and uh, look, a lot of them, you know, made, made them proud during that game the other night. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, and here's here's the thing, you know, people in their life should be working toward doing the things in life that they love to do. You know, uh, luckily I, I was able to do that, you know, s- several years ago. You know, finally get myself in a position where, you know, I get to sit and watch football and and and, and write and talk about the Steelers full time. So, uh, you know, everybody should be it should. Uh, uh, be striving to do that, and and you got to think that Daryl Drake was doing what he loved uh, to do more than anything else, and that was coaching young wide receivers at the NFL level, and he did it v- very well. So, you know, definitely going to be missed, but will not be forgotten. Absolutely, Dave, uh, and I, I appreciate the, the the outpouring of support from Steelers Nation too. I saw that was a really touching memorial uh, outside of St. Vincent. I know that area. As soon as you, if you're a fan, you're driving in. It's right by the fence line where you, where everybody uh, pulls in, so they'll get to see it tomorrow. So, like I said, the team announced that they're going to practice tomorrow, Tuesday, which was an originally scheduled off day, and then they'll go Wednesday, Thursday, which is part of their normal training camp schedule. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to add here. It's just, it was, it was shocking. It was devastating, and I can't imagine how it's impacting uh, the coaches and the players right now. Yeah, and you know, we're already getting a lot of questions about, you know, what will the Steelers do and all, and you know, I, I understand that, and and you know, some, you know, some people, I guess, would say that that's that's too soon and all. Look, the the team will make the decision what they feel the best. 
you know, course of action will be here. You know, uh, first thing that came to my mind, obviously, was was Richard Mann, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thinking that, that maybe he would want to come back for one more season. And, you know, uh, look, you know, how much do you think maybe a guy, you know, uh, the attitude of Antonio Brown <laughs> may be so got Richard Mann to throw his hands up and say, you know, the heck with, uh, you know, some of these players, you know, uh, some of them you just can't coach anymore. And, you know, makes you kind of wonder would would a be out of the picture and the way all this happened suddenly uh, with, with Daryl Drake, if, uh, if, if Mike, if the first person that, that Mike Tomlin calls when he picks up the phone uh, would be a guy like Richard Mann. You know, you have training camp obviously running, you know, uh, 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 coming to a close here. Uh, you would think that, that Richard Mann still has a pretty good idea what's going on in that room overall. Uh, obviously, some new faces in Deontay Johnson and and you know several other new faces, but there are a lot of familiar faces in that room as well too. Will that be the way they go? Will Mike Tomlin just take you know uh, take a more active role in that room? Will mm -hmm. Randy Feetner, whose plate's already full with the with the quarterbacks and all, uh, uh, take on a bigger role? I don't know, and it might take him you know a couple of days to figure this you know figure this out too i know a lot of people are suggesting because uh you know heinz ward is really kind of i guess you would say somewhat of a disciple of, of daryl drake uh uh heinz ward talked you know uh the last few days about how drake i think was one of the main reasons he ended up at georgia uh mm -hmm. uh, uh years ago there when you know when he was being recruited into college there i just think heinz ward's a little a little green you know and he's a lot green, actually, because he's 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 an intern for the uh, for the New York Jets uh, hmm. right now. Now, obviously, hmm. I'm sure that's something that could be worked around if the Steelers wanted to go that way. But quite honestly, I I just feel like it's uh, like you know like like. Uh, Heinz Ward is just a little bit too wet behind the ears when it comes to the coaching aspect of the room. So, you know, the first first name that, that jumped into my mind was obviously Richard Mann. But, you know, we'll sit and wait and see what the team has to say. Yeah, I, I got the comments, just, you know, on Sunday, and I, I didn't want to talk about it Sunday because I just wanted to, to digest the news and, and show respect to Drake uh, and, and put the focus on him. I have thought about it a little bit. I, I don't expect it to be Ward or really anybody outside the organization besides the potential of Richard Mann, who obviously was with the organization, but who knows where he's, he's even still in the area. I mean, I, I, who knows what his uh, plan is right now. But the team does have options. Mike Tomlin was the receiver. Obviously, William and Mary, Andy Feetner coached wide receivers. Now, obviously, like you said, his plate's pretty full with offensive coordinator and quarterbacks. But maybe they make Feetner more offensive coordinator and receivers coach. And they have someone like Matt Sims work more with the quarterbacks. That's a possibility. Blaine Stewart's an assistant on the coaching staff in his second year. He played receiver in college and high school. So uh, I, I don't know what direction they're going to go in. But they do have some options to, to, to try to replace Drake's uh, role. Yeah, and, and we'll see. And I think we're just getting word right now. Mike Tomlin will address the media at approximately 11 11.30 a.m. Uh, Tuesday. Uh, okay. You know, to uh, will be his next uh, press conference. I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about the, you know, uh, reflections back on 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 Drake and you know Coach Drake and his life and and, and all like that. So look forward to us covering that press conference uh, starting at 11:30 Eastern time in the morning. Right, and you probably it'll probably have already happen by the time I assume most people are listening to this. Is that so? Just to be clear, we, we're recording this before Donald's press conference. Uh, but yeah, it just you know, it, but it, in a way, it was it was so nice to see how important Coach Daryl Drake was and so the lives of so many players, and, and and to see that reflection that everyone could have and say how much he meant to them. And again, not only professionally but personally too. And even someone like Adante Moncrief has only been with his team for a couple months and the impact it seemed to have on him. And someone like Deontay Johnson, who, I mean, Coach Drake spoke so so highly of Deontay Johnson when they drafted him back in April. Um, it, I, it's just, uh, I'm really disappointed that Johnson obviously wasn't able to play uh, this past week with that groin injury. But, uh, you know, that's going to be part of his legacy. And, and so many players before him are, are part of that legacy, too. Yeah, absolutely. And like we said, you know, James Washington had a great, you know, uh, James Washington that, you know, Daryl Drake's been the only co wide receiver coach that, that James Washington has had at the NFL level so far. So uh, he definitely made made him proud the other night with that great game that mm -hmm. he had that, you know, since then, we, you know, a little bit of all 22 uh, tape has escaped from that game, if you will, showing some of the things that, that James Washington did. I'm sure, I'm sure Coach Daryl Drake was mighty, mighty proud of uh, the performance that James Washington had in that game.
Absolutely, Dave. Uh, I'm going to transition us, as difficult as it is, uh, into the rest of the Steelers game. Uh, we don't want to forget about Daryl Drake, but but I think you know we've said that all that, that, that needs to be said and, and how much we miss, but we'll hear more about it when, when Tomlin – uh, talks tomorrow to Tuesday, I should say, with the media. But Dave, uh, I'm sure you've gone through this game a lot. I've gone through it a lot now, charting it, rewatching it, combing through it uh, pretty closely. It, anything else stick out to you from from the Buccaneers game that you didn't see the first couple times through that you want to make special note of now? Yeah, not enough all 22 tape. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, yeah, I don't get why they don't offer it. I, mean, I don't. They have the tape. I mean, everyone, media guys have the tape. Uh, you know, national media guys. We, yeah. we, we should to be accessible to everybody. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the the deeper that we go through this TV tape, boy, there are a lot of Easter eggs in there, are mm-hmm. there not? I mean, you you found a few of them. I've found a few of them so far. Uh, man, uh, I don't. You know, we've already talked about. I, I think the 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 uh, the mo- most notable stuff and some of the most notable players and plays that happened in that game. Uh, Tuzar Skipper, wow. Uh, Mm -hmm. some heavy hands that kid has. And, you know, I obviously watched quite a bit of uh, uh, Toledo tape, you know, after he was signed and all like that and and, and did some study on him. But, man, he he really showed some nice heavy hand usage. And was that Kappa that he was schooling? uh? No, it was another tackle. But he was like – he's listed at 344. I forget his name, William Poole or something. He's a big dude. Boy, he Just is, and, and uh, he he got to taste uh, taste a little bit of a long arm uh, in, in there up high around the head and neck area a couple times uh, from Tuzar Skipper. So obviously, you know, look, you got to put this stuff into perspective, but there is a good base there to work with. You would think. Uh, look like Skipper's got. You know, has a little bit of a pass rush plan. Uh, not only does he have that long arm, he has a little bit of speed to power. He has that nice little hand swat and dip, uh, and and you know uh, ability to flatten out and all. But it really was impressive. And I think one of the Easter eggs that you po- posted uh, uh, later on uh, uh, Monday night was uh, him blowing up that goal line, uh, that goal line play late, late, late in the game, uh, sitting that I think it was a tight end just flat on his uh, keister and getting in on that tackle and. He, that's another play that you wish you had the all 22 on uh, to uh, to ex- to see exactly uh, what what went down there. So a uh, nice game from him uh, found, you know, and, and thanks to some of the stuff that you posted as well, too. And I think Nick's got an all 22. I mean, not an all 22, a, a film room segment post coming on uh, on Ulysses Gilbert. But, you know, we saw we saw some of the things that that I was hoping that would show up on tape uh, with uh, with Ulysses Gilbert in this game. Uh the ability to use some of that 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 short area quickness, speed, especially uh, chasing down from you know uh, back you know chasing the play down from from behind, which was uh, I think kind of happened later in the game on one of those red zone dump offs I think to a wide receiver there. Uh, obviously, he had the pass breakup in the end zone on the two point. Was that the, that was a two point conversion? Yeah, the uh, the, mm-hmm, inter- the interception. The, yeah, uh, the interception that he had there, and uh, uh, you know, a lot a lot of good stuff from him. Uh, Mondo uh, really showed out well, I thought, in that game. Nice little spin move uh, <laughs> uh, that he had for quarterback pressure there. Uh, uh, who else am I missing here? Those are the big ones. Uh, yeah, Skipper, uh, heavy hands, speed the power, a no nonsense pass rusher. Uh, obviously, he's gonna be a little stiff going backwards. I noted that, but you know, I talked to him uh, during the summer, and a, a really crazy backstory: foster child, bounced around from foster parent to group home. He finally got taken in by the family that um, he stole. Uh, with today but you know we went to uh, juco because his uh, grades weren't good enough because of you know the rough childhood and then i uh, went to toledo it was supposed to be the starter and i think 2017 towards acl in the third game went down to kick off and you know gets a medical hardship comes back has a good year but you know a tryout guy in pittsburgh was in kansas city camp didn't make it comes to pittsburgh gets a contract i mean so this guy's playing for everything in his mind right now he's gone through everything so he's someone that i think is gonna be mentally tough and i think has really good practice squad potential gilbert the third uh, everything i saw at camp translated to heinz field athleticism coverage ability playing in space closing speed you know running chase high effort guy excited about him he's taking a big step forward and clearly right now has a spot over sutton smith the other name i'd give you is uh, trey edmonds and i know that path of the 53 is going to be difficult but i think there's a lot of value and pretty unique value that he has and being special teams capable uh, the starting up 
back, which he won't be obviously week one, but he's capable of that. They, they trust him to do that. Uh, had a kick coverage tackle, and his passing protection I thought was excellent. He's a physical guy that was, you know, I, I talked about on the last podcast, Gerald Hawkins knocking down these guys on the edge, and I was like, that was surprising for Hawkins. I was wrong. It wasn't Hawkins. It was Edmonds chipping these guys and putting them on their butt. So uh, that's a guy that I think pretty confident, especially with the injury to Ralph Webb's going to uh, land back on the practice squad. I can hear it now. You can't cut Skipper or Gilbert because they'll never clear waivers. <laughs> yeah, Skipper would be fine. Gilbert would be interesting. If he plays like this, that might be one of the exceptions where you're like, ah. you know, someone might get noticed. But uh, but I think he's got a good he's got a good track for the 53. Yeah, uh, he he's look Gilbert. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean he is on a good track. I mean when we mention this, it it feels like a battle between Sutton and it feels like. You know, Gilbert's leading that battle right now, and obviously the best ability uh, is is availability, and he's got that right now. We'll have to see if uh, if Sutton Smith can can hop on real quick here. This uh, this coming, you know, JT Jones, another one didn't play too terribly bad. I was looking for more. I thought. He had a good first step. He actually caught him caught off sides once and almost a second time, but sure. he struggled to, to flatten the edge, and the run game is going to be a, always a weakness for him being a, a thinner, smaller build. But I thought Skipper was, was clearly I, – I think I know you're oh, yeah, yeah, Skipper yeah. was clearly better than Oh, Jones. yeah, yeah. It wasn't even close there. I mean, if you're talking about a an outside linebacker, hey, hey, could we have a situation where Sutton Smith, I mean, doesn't even make the practice squad? I mean – it's possible, cross, right? Cross my mind, yeah. Or if this injury happens, he goes to IR for a year if his injury is bad enough, which I don't have any indication that it is. It doesn't look like it, but who knows? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's got he's got to earn it. Nothing, you know. Josh Frazier cut out right last year. We've seen guys fifth, sixth round picks get cut out right before. The last thing I want to talk about with the linebackers, at least with that group specifically, is that just how important practice is and the reason why you practice and, and how it translates to game day. You talk about, you know, Gilbert III had a good pressure, created an incompletion. Obviously, Medikevich's, which is probably more memorable, his forced fumble that he had at the end of the first half. Those are backs on backers drills where it's one on one with the back. You create this space. And, and that's why you you rep it so hard in practice. You have those moments. You run it in team session. You do it one on one. So when you go to game day, these linebackers are in these situations before because I'm betting in Tampa Bay. They've run backs on backers the way that they do in Pittsburgh. So these young backs are just deer in the headlights, and they're just getting swam over, swam over by these linebackers because these linebackers are doing it every day in practice. So I, I think that's something that's important to talk about, you know, coaching efficiently, but coaching physically too. And I think you saw that payoff in the preseason game when we talked about Gilbert and Medikevich winning their one-on-one -on -one battles. How many times have we said over the years about running backs in Pittsburgh being able to get on the field, got to be able to pass protect? You yeah, know. And, and they all pass pro. You know, Edmonds did well in pass pro. Sure. Snell did well in pass pro. And again, that's the other benefit of backs on backers. Those backs, you know, running backs, have now put their face on the fans. So in, when it comes to a game, they're like, okay, I've done this before. I know how to do it. Uh, you know, where, I, and, and, and kind of plays into a little bit here with, with uh, us redoing. Our, and I think yours is going up Tuesday morning. You're 53. Mm -hmm. uh, mine and Matthew's are already up. The newest updated 53-man roster prediction. I think the – what were my only changes on that? I swapped Sutton Smith comes off. Uh, Gilbert the third goes on. Uh, I think uh, my latest one I had – uh, Cameron Kelly back on, Marcus Allen off. Yeah, uh, I don't know what all what all changes. It was pretty similar. And mine's yeah. going to end up being pretty similar to yours. I think we're all going to be pretty close to you and Matthew. I think I only had the two changes this go around. And someone said, well, is that an overreaction? Yeah. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you want us to do uh, this time of year? Because, I mean, we're, we're, the you know uh, from here on out, barring injury, our 53s are going to be relatively close mm -hmm. week to week. But, I mean, you have to – I think you have to flow with what you've seen already. And I haven't seen Sutton Smith yet. Yeah. yeah and, go through the 53. I think there's a train coming on my end. So go through the yeah. – there it is. Go through the 53, and I'll, I'll jump back in. All right. Well, let me, let me pull up my 53 real quick and – kind of kind of roll through it but as i mentioned there are not many overall changes i mean the quarterbacks are obviously uh the same with uh with with uh hold on here with ben roethlisberger joshua dobbs and and mason rudolph and i'm pulling it up right here now uh, the running backs, no changes there. James Conner, Jalen Samuels, Benny Snell, uh, Benny Snell Jr., the third one, uh, fullback the same, Roosevelt next. Wide receivers unchanged, but, uh, you know, it's not going to take much more. I mean, it's going to be interesting to watch play out. I would not bet my life on this six right now. I would bet my life on the first uh, on the first four of them, talking about Juju Smith-Schuster, Dante Moncrief, uh, James Washington, and Deontay Johnson. After that, 
Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to watch this play out. No changes, though, from the last time. I still have Switzer and Eli Rogers as number five and six, uh, however way you want to stack them there. Uh, tight ends, no changes there. Uh, McDonald, Xavier Grimble, Zach Gentry. And Zach Gentry is another guy, I think, that, that played a little bit better than what I expected. I think I mentioned that on the podcast the other day. I have a film room up now on his, uh, what did they run, five or six? Well, I was right, five or six running plays, I think, in, in total that they ran uh, – with, with Gentry in the game, uh, two of them I think were away from Gentry. You know, really didn't factor into him, and the three that really uh, involved him, I thought he did a good job on two of them uh, there. So two out of three there. Obviously, we're going to be tracking Gentry and and uh, his run blocking quite a bit moving forward here into the preseason. Uh, offensive lineman, I don't think I had any change here. Still the same same nine: Pouncey, DeCastro, Ramon Foster, Villanueva, Finney, Matt Filer, uh, Chiquamo, Corfor, Fred Johnson, and Zach Banner. Fred Johnson. And Zach Banner, we mentioned the other day, played a lot of snaps in that game. It really, yep. it really, really feels like both those guys uh, are trending to uh, or, or have great, great, great inside shots at the mm-hmm. 53-man roster. Uh, defense, no change on the offensive line. Um, uh, was excited to see Isaiah Bugs play pretty good in the, I think, 30 or 31 total snaps that he had. Real impactful, get, drawing a few holding calls early uh, uh, when he was on the field uh, uh, during the game as well, too. And I thought he had a couple of nice uh, p- uh, plays against the run uh, as well. The inside linebackers is where I did have the one change instead of carrying uh, the four. I now have him carrying five with uh, Ulysses Gilbert joining uh, Vince Williams, Mark Barron, Devin Bush, and Tyler Matikavich. I have one less outside linebacker uh, after this uh, preseason game, uh, and that one less is Sutton Smith for the time being. I have Bud Dupree, T.J. Watt, Chickalo, and uh, Adene uh, uh, right now is the four. Uh, the six cornerbacks still, Joe Hayden, Stephen Nelson, Mike Hilton, Artie Burns, Justin Lane, Cameron Sutton. No changes there, and I did have a change at the safety position there. Sean Davis, Terrell Edmonds. I now have Cameron Kelly in there, joining Jordan Dager for the field in there. I have Marcus Allen Allen, you know, I think I don't think Marcus Allen is a lock. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm also not ready, ready to rule out completely that he mm-hmm. won't make the 53-man roster. But for all practical purposes, I don't think I had Kelly. I think after having Kelly on my first 53, I pulled him off in favor of Dangerfield and Allen, and now I'm putting Kelly back on in 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 lieu of Marcus Allen. Obviously, my specialists uh, remain the same as well too. So I think overall, I had the two changes: adding Cameron Kelly and adding uh, Ulysses Gilbert, subtracting Sutton Smith and. Subtract in Marcus Allen. Thank you for stretching that out for me. I appreciate it. Uh, let me reset this because I have a couple questions I want to ask you about your thought process with your roster and just kind of how things might go in general. I want to start with receivers. That's probably the first really interesting position group for working offense and defense. Eli Rogers played five snaps on Friday. Splitzer, I believe, played 21. For Eli, only playing five snaps, played the first series, basically then got out. Is that a good sign for his roster spot that he played so little and then they took him out? I would think so. <laughs> I, I did, too. That was my reaction. You look at the guys that played early, then got out, you know, Barron, Alu to an extent. I mean, you know, those guys, you know, were in early, and then they left pretty early. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would take it that way, personally. Those animals played 15, 20 snaps and then got out. So it kind of felt like Rogers is, like, not a lock, but I, I said he was more secure than Switzer, and Twitter did not like me for saying that, but that's just how I interpreted it. I'm not saying that's how I, it should be. I just kind of... What the tea leaves tell who, me. Who, who took issue with it? The, uh, all of Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> Except way. Switzer himself, which I thought Switzer himself was probably going to jump in there at some point, to be honest with you. Uh, look, I mean, you would think, I mean, Eli didn't, I mean, Eli played, uh, you know, a few snaps when he came back last season, obviously, but mostly in, in uh, what, four and five wide receiver sets, right? Yeah, he came back week 15 against uh, New England and then played the rest of the season. Right. But I don't know. I, I interpreted that as a good sign for his standing, that they felt like, you know, because – I know that he's more known than Ryan Switzer, but you know Eli's still coming off his torn ACL, like you said, came back late last year. He's still good to get him through the offseason program, get him through a camp, let him hit the ground running. So the fact that they're letting him play early and then taking him off tells me that they want to count on Eli to really contribute this year, and they don't want to risk an injury, and they've seen all they need to see from him. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I, I, I took it that way. I took it as a good sign for Rodgers. Now, whether or not it is, it's yet to be seen. Will we mm-hmm. see a? What happens if we see a flip flop of that this next week? It's a good point. Fair point. I hadn't thought of that. 
you know, so are we going to go back the other way? Maybe they just wanted to see Switzer in, in certain situations there because it's kind of hard maybe to get both of them on the field at the same time, right? Yeah, but I figured you could play Rodgers more than five snaps. You give Rodgers a first half, Switzer the second half, and you still see him how it's, you know in situations you needed to see them in. That would be my thought, at least, if they were going to do that. Yeah, I mean, we are so like, It's not like a quarterback. You can look, play, still play one of those guys or you, know, you can have a bunch of receivers on the field. be fine. And, and look, it, it's far from over at this point right now, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I mean, I did kind of take it that way uh, to, to, to start with. You also wrote, talking about Johnny Holton, uh, he's not on your 53. Is he on your practice squad? Is he, he should be eligible, I think. I know rules get weird. So yeah, he's on your practice squad. I, okay. I, th- I think he is. He should be, because they, they have that exception now where you can be three years of crew and, and have two of those guys to make the practice squad. What does he have to do to make the 53? And hypothetically, if he makes it as number six, whose spot is he taking, Switzer or Eli? Yes. <laughs> you got to I, I gotta play bad cop here. I got to throw the... The spotlight on you. All right. No, no. In all serious, seriousness, though, I mean, he's got to be excellent on special teams. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. he, he's got to be a guy that Danny Smith is pounding the table for, uh, you know, as one of those gunners or whatever. And look, he can, he can get down the field. We saw him do that, right? Yeah. Forced at least one fair catch and I think impacted another. And he can kick return, too. I mean, he was your opening kick returner on, on Friday. Right. So, I mean, who's been – who's – I know people get at, and we're going to answer one of these in 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 the email listener email again as well too. Uh, I think Eli Rogers has more value overall, top to bottom value to this team than Ryan Switzer does. So Johnny Holton, uh, because he's more of a backup Z too, you know, gives you a little something extra there. You know, he he becomes a, you know basically becomes another version of of, of uh, uh, Darius Hayward Bay, a younger one. You know, mm-hmm. uh, obviously not as experienced uh, th- that kind of aspect. But I mean, it's like you're swapping Darius Hayward Bay for a younger version of him. Mm-hmm. Uh, not a guy that's obviously going to be on the field getting a lot of snaps. But I mean, if he's going to be more special teamer than he will wide receiver until needed as a wide receiver, if that makes sense. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone. One stone, and like I said, he is a guy that 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 you know can can go out there and serve primarily as a Z for you if you need it. So you're saying if he's taking a spot, he'd be Switzer's spot over Eli in all likelihood. If I were to have to guess right yeah, now, that, yes, yes. Okay, and I know I'm really taking this to the extreme, but let's assume Holton's on, Switzer's off. Who's your starting kick returner and punt returner for Week One? Golly. I'm thinking Holton would be your kick returner. I think he could. I mean, look, he showed some great open field awareness. I mean, there was a lot of open field, you know, especially when mm-hmm. he, once he cut back after after getting that uh, that pass from Mason Rudolph the other night. Uh, how many kickoff did it, I'm trying to remember how did he return any kickoffs the other night? Holton, yeah, he had the two, or he had the opening kickoff. He took. He probably shouldn't have taken it out, but right. I think he wanted to do. I think. I think at least another. That maybe, was the uh, one he caught like three. He caught three yards uh, deep, wasn't it? Yeah, he just like he stood there for a second, like he wanted to take a knee, and then he just ran it out because he's like, I need, I need to make a play here, which I, I can understand. Um, and he did it in college. I mean, he hasn't done a ton of it, but he did it in college. So I think Colton could be your kick returner. They like bigger guys. He's a hard guy to bring down. He's a long strider. He gets a hole. You know, he might run away from some people, and then probably. Eli or Deontay Johnson would be your punt returner. That's my thought of how it would go. And this is all hypothetical. Like I, I, I'm, spoiler alert, my wide receiver group's going to be the same as yours. I have Switzer and Eli going to make it right now, and I think that's the likely way it's going to go. But if you had to play devil's advocate, Holton out or Holton in, Switzer out, Holton will be a kick returner, and then either Eli or Deontay Johnson your punt returner. That makes sense. Okay. Fair you know, and, and I, I want to save the back end of this for 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 the uh, Twitter question that that I mean uh, for the email question that we have later in here, uh, kind of on that same topic. Okay, I will move along then. And I only other one I really wanted to really talk about in depth was Marcus Allen, and I guess it's a pretty easy question. I'm sure a lot of it's going to revolve around special teams, but what does Allen have to do to get back onto the roster? Because that's probably the biggest surprise is seeing not seeing Marcus Allen's name on that list. He probably has to beat out Jordan Dangerfield. Yeah. And that's For not sure. that, that's that's going to be tough to do, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, I agree. Uh, and look, Marcus Allen is, a, is, is, from what I remember, is a good tackler. But uh, you know, you, if you're Danny Smith and you're, you're right now and you're forced to choose between those two guys, who are you banging the table for? Yeah, I mean, the problem is Dangerfield's a really good tackler too. So Allen's not special in that regard. Right. 
I mean, sure, sure. And, and Dangerfield, you know, uh, he's he's got to be a Danny Smith favorite. You know, he's been around this mm-hmm. long and, and, and everything like that. And he can play. You know, technically he can play both safety positions for you. I feel a lot more comfortable with him closer to the line of scrimmage. And, we, you know, we've seen that in, in his – uh, in his limited time in the past. I mean, he played pretty well. Who was it, Kansas City a few years ago or, or last yeah. season? Or he was year? playing, I think, free safety that game, uh, I yeah. think. Uh, I can't or no, remember. it actually was probably strong safety because I think he replaced Sean Davis, who was playing strong safety right. at that time. Yeah, he, I mean, he, he's played both, obviously. Uh, I, think he, I think he forced a turnover, I think, in that game. I think it was a, a sack off the edge he came in on. Blitz uh, sack fumble. Uh, yeah, he can play both. He's better strong safety than free, but they, they've played him at both. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree that Allen's got to pick it up. He can still make it, but it's been quiet for him. You know, I thought a guy that would really take a jump, but uh, I haven't seen it. Dave, uh, go ahead and run through your practice squad. That's one part I, I, I didn't let you get to and just kind of talk about any decisions you wrestled with or guys you think were particularly impressive that you think have really good chances to make the practice squad if not they're gonna if not landing on the 53 well i'm trying to find out what i did in my post right now <laughs> do you want me to read it off yeah, yeah read I'll, them I, off to me trey edmonds at running back Derwin gray and jc hossenauer are your offensive lineman johnny holton at receiver christian scotland williamson's your ex- exception player as uh, the 11th man through the international pathway program henry mondo at uh, defensive line brian allen at corner marcus allen at safety so you do keep allen but just on the practice squad and then two outside linebackers sutton smith and two's our skipper i'm guessing you would say that skipper uh, has the is probably the, one of the guys with the best chance to make the 50 the practice squad if not the 53 is that fair? Uh, or do you feel like he's got a good chance to make the practice squad? Yeah, I mean, Skipper, obviously, uh, and all that obviously rolls off of, uh, uh, you know, Gilbert making, you know, uh, mm-hmm. make, making the 53 and all. Uh, who do I have? Holton on there, and I have Mondo's, uh, Mondo's, uh, uh, or uh, uh, how do you? Yeah, you have do, Henry Mondo. You have Mondo's Mondo. on there. That's a classic overreaction, but, I mean, I thought he played well, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hit him on my last uh, – practice squad uh, i don't i don't think oh. i i think i had hooks on there uh on, okay. on my last one there uh marcus out i'm not quite i can't remember brian allen and and, and his eligibility man i get so screwed up with with the eligibility rules with the he practice should still squad be, should still be eligible yeah i you know, i have to double check that but uh i have two allens on there i know that one cornerback and one one safety marcus and brian uh the jc the the uh the two linemen uh uh derwin gray obviously the the draft pick although uh, and I, I hadn't really you you showed about the six snaps or whatever that uh, that that Brumfield played might be a little bit something there right you know as a guard I mean it'd be interesting to see uh, Brumfield play a little bit more you know in these next next uh, in this next preseason game I think at least on those six or whatever snaps that he played uh, the other night he deserves a little another chance now I, I don't think he has any center background with him i think i think he's just primarily a guard and then uh you know the only bad thing about it is keeping both uh derwin gray and brumfield you're keeping two guards essentially even though uh, gray i guess you 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 would kind of be put a slash next to but i Mm -hmm. i really think they view him more as a guard at this point we'll see if he plays any tackle moving forward and who else who else did i have on there uh, Hassenauer is your other offensive lineman. I think I'd keep Patrick Morris over. I think I think Patrick Morris played pretty well on Friday, and I was pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah, I, I'm not married to ha- you know Hassenauer yeah. by, by any stretch. And look, Edmonds, I think is, you know, if they don't keep him on the 53 at this point, and if he stays healthy because of uh, his special teams background and what what he probably gives you as far as a, a good player to be on the looks team and all like that, uh, I mm-hmm. think Edmonds, you're you're going to probably keep at least one running back on your 53. So so that would be him and Holton just because of you know. Uh, uh, more position kind of, you know, gives you a little bit as a return man. It gives you uh, more of a true Z, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I think is the reason I kept him as well. Yeah, I know it's practice squad, so it's not worth fighting about too much. Brian Allen's the only one I think I'd have a, a disagreement with. I mean, if he's not making it now, then what's the point? I think you cut him loose. I know the corner depth is really thin with all the injuries and who else do you keep? But, you know, Allen didn't make the 53 last year. Got called up halfway through, didn't play defense. I think I just cut Brian Allen loose at that point. Just cut my losses. Yeah, that's on it. And look, I mean, this thing's gonna my, my practice sure. squad's gonna flip, you know, seven more times and three more opportunities. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I got you. Fair enough. 
Uh, Dave, I want to circle back to quarterbacks and just kind of talk about a big picture because I'm sure, like you, uh, I've gotten the most comments about the quarterback situation after all three that played on Friday played well. But, of course, especially talking about Devlin Hodges and everyone's telling me, can Hodges make this team? Can he beat out Dobbs? Okay, they're not telling me or asking me. They're telling me that Hodges is better than Josh Dobbs to get rid of Josh Dobbs. What is your take on the situation, both for that battle and then the backup spot in general? Has it been decided? What more do you want to see from these guys? And is there any way for Devlin Hodges to make this team 53 or practice squad? And evidently, I've become all of a sudden a huge Joshua Dobbs fan. Yeah, you were – go Vols. That's what you were telling me before we went on the podcast. Yeah, right? he's evidently my boy now. Uh, oh. how people get that, uh, I don't understand. You try to give them an ob- objective look at, at every pass thrown, and because he's not the guy that you want, you automatically take issue with somebody praising the other guy. Uh, that's not that, that's not being objective at all, you know, w- w- when you do that. Now, uh, look, was Josh Dobbs perfect the other night? Absolutely not, and I think uh, – Correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't I? Didn't I uh, smite him for two of the throws uh, in in that breakdown? You know, the one <laughs> smites a strong word here. <laughs> uh, you had Rudolph above Dobbs in performance, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Right. I mean, two, look. I mean, Dobbs uh, the uh, the throw down the left left side that was picked off, called it back by penalty, was you know, not not the best decision, nor was the one uh, the overthrow uh, for whatever reason. We don't know the true reason. Did did Tevin Jones? You know, did did Tevin? Run the right route, you know, you, you'd assume that he did, but we obviously don't have all the all 22 of that game. All we can assume is that Dobbs kind of forced that thing into really what was essentially four guys around mm-hmm. Tevin Jones at that time, and the ball was clearly uh, way too high for Tevin Jones to catch, and you know, quite surprisingly, it wasn't picked off when you have that many uh, uh, players around uh, uh, around a uh, uh, football that sells on you like that. Uh, you know, a lot of people trying to give Dobbs crap for the uh, throw to uh, Washington in the end zone what i mean obviously we don't have a great great you know view of that but i mean the the, the view that i the, the several views that i've seen i thought it was a great throw i mean uh you know six out of ten times you know I, i'm guessing washington maybe can get two feet down on that yeah and you're referring to for people who don't remember the one where he caught it along the sideline and his left toe was out of bounds and it was the correct call he didn't come in bounds with it. But I thought it was a good throw. I thought the ball placement was excellent. Throw it high, throw it away. Your guy's going to get it or no one's going to get it. That that was my mentality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look. Now, I mean, the, go ahead. The one, I'll, the one I'll give him guff for is that 43-yarder to Washington that was complete. I know the Dobbs talked about, oh, I didn't want to overthrow it. That was a bad throw. That should have been six. He underthrew that pretty poorly. Right. I, and, I, and, and I said that in my breakdown, too. You know, yeah, I mean, no, I know. You know, that, that, that one was, was a little bit underthrow. I mean, yeah, you can't judge everything just off of results alone. But. You know, he got it to where his guy could make a play and and should have been more out in front because uh, the, the step that really more than a step, two steps uh, mm-hmm. uh, that, that he had on, on, on Vernon Hargraves there, a, a very a decent corner in the NFL as well, too. You know, uh, yeah, that, you know, that 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 could have very easily been six. You know, uh, are, are we are we smiting Ben Roethlisberger, though, if he underthrows that just the same? I mean, I think we're having the same discussion. You know, saying that boy Ben should have got, got that out there a little bit more, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, look, I'm not going to kill him for that 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 throw. You know, no, but I, I want to know it. It, it need, and, and and it was noted. You know, okay, yeah, I, I know, I know that you were, but that would be that was one of the poorest throws that he had was that, and then the the throw into quadruple coverage of Tevin Jones was uh, I, I don't know what he saw because I couldn't see the whole thing like you said, but again, I, I thought that Dobbs had. A good game overall, and the mobility is certainly an interesting element that not every quarterback has because if you're the number two and you're Dobbs and you're a mobile guy, you know, when you get thrown into a game because Ben's hurt, the energy's different, you're just trying to make a play, you know, it's so hard to address on the fly. So just having that mobility is really important because you know that Dobbs can just make a play with his legs and maybe that's enough to get you through, convert a third down, get you through a drive, a series, through a game, close it out or something like that. So, you know, I think that mobility um, it is a big positive factor uh, in his cap right now. Yeah, look, I mean, who had the better game? Rudolph obviously had the better game. Yep, I agree. Uh, Dobbs, though, you know, uh, look, I mean, it's one of his better pre... It wasn't as good as his his Carolina game, you know. 
Uh, but make no mistake, too, there were a few times last year during the preseason that, uh, and people don't want, still don't want to admit that, you know, the people who were in the Do- Joshua Dobbs fan club, Josh Dobbs got bailed out on a couple of those throws. You know, I think James Washington even bailed him out on one in the end zone. You know, mm-hmm. uh, last year I don't remember if it was the Panthers game uh, or, or or one earlier in the season there, but uh, uh, make no mistake about it, the better quarterback, although he didn't complete, you know, didn't have the uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, you know average depth of target uh, numbers that that uh, that Dobbs did, but make no mistake about it, that that you know Rudolph uh, one of those throws down the sideline to Jones was one that Jones caught. He just didn't get two feet uh, down uh, in. Back bounds and one of them on the what was it a third and 12 or whatnot where Spencer uh, I I would like to see that route on the all 22 you know to 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 uh, get a better view on, on how hard Spencer worked back to come back at the football and all you know to me I think that's a now pro football focus did not charge Spencer with a drop on 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 that play uh, but I kind of felt that they should have. I mean, they they, mm-hmm. they they doled out a uh, pass defense on that play, but that was a very catchable ball. So that's two of Dobbs' incompletions, one that was caught and one that, that probably should have been caught. And the other one was him uh, uh, extended the play, you know, and, and yep. that was the one, and, was, and that's another one to hard, to hard to see just how uh, just how catchable that, that ball might have been. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, I think that's a good assessment. What I mean, Hodges impressed me though, and I think he impressed everybody. But I, I would love to put together a, a, a short clip or reel of what he did on third down because I thought on third down was where he was at his best. He got burned by drops. Tevin Jones had one. Brandon Riley had one. But I mean, just evaluate Hodges' performance after you've gone through the tape, and I think it was a lot of positive. I haven't gone. I haven't gone. Uh, that that's next on the list. I haven't gone for the ball placement yet yet on all his yet so uh give me until you know uh, a few more days to talk maybe by the time we roll around to the uh tomorrow night's podcast i'll have more of a thought but i mean overall first glance yeah i mean look he had some great touch on that i mean one of those was dropped by spencer which was a drop uh and uh trying to think there was it seems like there was another drop drop in there too wasn't there? i had jones and riley with drops and or maybe it was those no, i know i know i know riley spencer and uh, riley yeah yes, you're right spencer had one i know riley had one yeah and they were both on third down and they were both really well thrown that that ball to spencer i think was the best pass any steelers quarterback made all night that's how good it was oh, over yeah. the defender on the sideline third down stepping into the throw it was a great throw and look, I mean, we talked about this the other. I mean, for <laughs> you got to be ticked. I think back back to the uh, back to the original point of your uh, where you started this off with. Uh, right now, I mean, Alex, I mean, the Hodges story is great. I thought he played great. I mean, heck, he played more snaps than we've seen a a tech, tech you know quote unquote fourth string quarterback play in a preseason game in quite a while. I think uh, I didn't. It didn't look like it was too big for him. But I mean, are, are you telling me that that? And look, I we've said right from the get go, we expect Rudolph to win the backup job, right? And and, and uh, on pay uh, on there, on, that's on pace to happen right now. But there still are three preseason games left. Uh, can Hodges overtake a guy like Dobbs? Uh, in you know, in the next three games, I don't. I'm not sure he's going to get enough snaps. First of all, uh, to do that, and why would you, you don't think? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, he's going to get some in that final one. Yeah, I mean, that's how Dobbs won the job last year was in the finale. Do you view Hodges as Cinderella, where the clock's going to strike 12 and he's going to go back? Whatever. I don't know. I can't describe Cinderella, but you know what I mean. Or he's just going to – this is going to be a flavor of the month, a DeMond Patterson kind of situation? I mean, history says that he's going to have a hard, hard, hard time, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, do you think he can keep up this play? Do you think that he's going to eventually come down and he's going to have his warts? Because he did have one bad throw where he threw uh, – it was pressured, but he threw just a, a lame duck, duck that should have been picked, I think Trey Griffey on, on the left sideline. And that was, I think, a third down around the 30-yard line where it's, that was a, a terrible mistake by him. I mean, all I got is one game on him, Alex. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, you know – it's hard to draw hard conclusions off this. I mean, look, I, I obviously hey, here's where I was a year ago. All right. I mean, I honestly thought that the team should have kept Landry Jones and try to try to trade away Dobbs 
uh, at, after the preseason was over. OK, mm. uh, I honestly thought that was the way they should have gone. Uh, and I still stand behind the fact that, yeah, it was one game. and I don't want to uh, you know, kill the guy for it. Uh, but uh, if you play, if you put Landry Jones in that game against the Raiders, I like my chances of winning that game more so than I did having Dobbs in there. Mm. I, I understand. Is there are you trying to make a point to this current situation? I'm not sure what you're getting at with that. I, I'm just saying that that I expect I expect Rudolph be, unless you're able to deal Dobbs again. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, uh, uh, would you be comfortable enough with Hodges as your number three? You know, to uh, look, I like the idea of having two dogs in one bone at that position. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, they're all fighting for it. Again, I don't think anything's locked up yet. Rudolph may have the early lead on the number two spot, but I don't think anything. See, and everybody just thinks you just push this button, you trade away Joshua Dobbs. OK, right. uh, for for a four, for a fourth or a fifth. I mean, it sounds good in theory, but what what if he what if he has similar performances to what he had the other night? OK, uh, you know, I mean, well, that'd be a good thing. I think they were a good performance. Yeah, I mean, you still I mean the, the interception. I mean, they, they, it wasn't perfect. No, it wasn't perfect. It was good, though. I think but, I, but it I was good. good. I mean, okay. is there a team? I mean, look, the Eagles just lost I mean, uh, Sudfeld for how long? Right. But I mean, are they? Are, you know, he is, is he's going to be back in like six weeks. I mean, do you trade for a guy? You know, I guess here's what I'm getting at: is is it possible they got a sixth or a seventh maybe for for Dobbs? I suppose it's possible. I mean, but I mean, yeah, you're not going to cut him. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you you have to be firmly in the camp of. Man, we can really live with 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 De- Devlin Hodges is is the better quarterback sure. than than sure. Dobbs. That's that's the only reason you trade away Dobbs, in my opinion, uh, is because you come away out of preseason saying Devlin's a better quarterback than Dobbs. I know this will be a crazy question to ask, and not. I, ha- I have a feel. I feel we're going to be laughing about all this in a few more weeks. Yeah. You know, as qu- you say, quite honestly, it, it all have comes a funny out way of right. Out. They have a funny way <laughs> of working themselves out, and then like you know, like old man said, it all comes out in the wash here sooner or later. But but I, I know this is going to be a crazy question, and you can laugh at me for it. Feel, feel free to. I won't get offended. But is it possible where they say, you know, we're not trading Dobbs. There's not enough takers. We like Dobbs too much. But we also like Devlin Hodges a lot. And there are just there are so few good quarterbacks in this league. We like the competition. Could they keep the three on the 53, Ben, Rudolph, and Dobbs? You know, Rudolph probably number two, Dobbs number three. But again, open. And could they keep Devlin Hodges on the practice squad as a number four? And I know as a number four, he's going to have nothing to do. He's going to be a water boy. But they just say, this guy's too talented. We want to keep our best guys in the practice squad. You know, dogs, we don't know what the future's going to be. Let's just hold on to Hodges for as long as we possibly can. I, I don't see I don't see, don't see why. It? Yeah, I don't see why you would do that because Cause a, cause it's, cause you want to keep your best players on your team and not cut good players. It's just in the way that you would keep Dobbs if he's the better quarterback than Hodges. Yeah, I just I don't I don't see it, man. No. I mean, come come come. Like I said, I mean, how much are we how much are we going to see Ben in this next game? None, right? None. Third game and that's it. Third quarter for him is going to be it. Who starts this next game? Rudolph. Rudolph. Yeah. Uh, and you're, I mean, hopefully it's Rudolph because Tomlin's probably already said it by the now people listen to this, but I assume it's going to be Rudolph. I mean, you're going to keep probably. I mean. How much more do you want to see? Uh, you got to get Rudolph more snaps. How many snaps yeah. did he play on uh, Friday? It was like to, two series, wasn't it? Nah, it was a little more than that. I mean, three series? Hold on a minute here. I don't know exactly how many snaps that translates to, but he uh, – because Devlin came in. Hodges, uh, Rudolph got a ha- the first drive of the second half. Uh, 16, 16. 16 snaps. All right, so it was like three. And Hard Dobbs six. played 21. Yeah, and Hodges got – what did Hodges get? More than that? 28. He could play the rest of the game. Uh, yeah, no, Rudolph's got to get a lot of play time for sure. He's got to start. He probably play almost the whole first half. Well, look, I mean, are, are you going to try to get uh, Hodges the, 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 uh, the same amount of snaps that you just got him? Maybe a little less. Depends. I mean, maybe a quarter, maybe the fourth quarter. I don't know. I have a feeling we're going to be laughing about all this. Here, here's the last thing I'll say on the quarterback situation. People keep asking me, you know, who's 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 going to be the guys? Dobbs? Is it Hodges? 
The good thing is no decisions have to be made today or tomorrow or next week. you got three games to figure this thing out. There are going to be open battles, open competition. We're going to learn a lot more about all three guys the rest of the way, especially Rudolph, especially Hodges. So it's okay to say for a moment, and I'm saying it, I don't know exactly how this is going to go. But that's okay because I got some time to figure it out, and I think this team's going to take it up until the you know clock strikes midnight to, to make their final determination just as they did last year with Josh Dobbs basically winning that job in the preseason finale. Look, I've seen him play one game. Uh, and how many snaps did you just tell me he played? 28. Uh, in the first preseason game against a bunch of people who are going to be unemployed soon. Well, he's going to play against those guys no matter what he steps into, okay. you know, unless he starts one of these games, which he which he's not. And Look, I'm, was... I'm not going to rule out <sighs> – I, let me tell you, I, I'm going to, and, and people should, I'll, I'll take a lot of issue with them spending a fourth round pick on Dobbs, turning around and spending a third round pick on Rudolph, and then turn around in, in year three and, uh, and, 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 you know, trading Dobbs away for, for a bag of footballs. Well, if it's a six-round pick, I won't be too mad about it. You get, you just, you found a quarterback that has some sort of value, just in the way that Landry Jones didn't turn into a whole lot, but you were happy with what he gave you. And I think with how a lot of these backup quarterbacks, mid-round quarterbacks go that don't do anything ever, I think it could be a whole lot worse fates for drafting somebody like Josh Dobbs. Are, are you buy? It sounds like you're buying all this. No, you're, I'm you're, just you're buying. A, you're buying that there's there there is the possibility that that Hodges is the better quarterback than Dobbs. No, I didn't even say better quarterback. I think there's a lot to learn about it. I, I'm just recognizing that Hodges has continued to impress in every situation. And you, maybe that's you've seen him more than I have. I mean, yeah, maybe that. And, and the number I was going to throw out to you, you, and I know the numbers only mean so much. It's camp, and I'm being a nerd here, so let me have my you know pocket protector and, and all that, But the big glasses. But but you know who the quarterback of the four that has the best completion percentage in camp is right now? Just well, camp stats. I'm going to guess you. it's going to be Hodges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Bart Houston. No, it's, it's definitely Hodges. I mean, that almost 70%. So he's been efficient. He's taken chances. He's done well in two minutes. He's done well in seven shots. He's done well uh, on third down in the game situation. He's done well overall in that game, just managing things. I'm just recognizing that Devlin Hodges has played well. And if somebody somebody came to me for a fifth for Josh Dobbs and I knew that Rudolph was going to win the number two, would I do it? I'd certainly consider it for a long time. Look, let's see if Hodges can outplay – I'll, I'll play Dobbs here the rest of the way. Right. I, I just I just don't want to say that there's no way for Hodges to do anything because then it's like, you know, what's the point of even signing him in the first place? If there's no scenario where he can make it no matter how well he plays, no matter what he does, no matter how many challenges uh, he answers, you know, I think everyone's got to have a chance. I think that's been the mentality of this team for a long time. So I'm not – again, my roster tomorrow, another spoiler alert, Dobbs is going to be on it. Rudolph's going to be on it. Hodges is nowhere to be found at the moment. But I'm open to watching these guys a whole lot more. All right, what happens if he comes out and lays an egg in this next game? Are, that's you, what I'm are saying. you over yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a clock strike 12 with him. So that's, you know, I don't want to get I don't want to get too high on it, obviously. Like a lot of fans are going crazy right now and I'm well, trying to we, pull we, back, we, but we, I don't want to get too low either. We warn people not to overreact on 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 one game, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I need, I need to see more. Sure. I get that. All right, uh, we'll get off that topic. I'm sure we'll get a lot of mail about that for the next episode, Dave. You had a I, I, the, the funny thing is, is people, boy, they're they're they draw lines in the sand quick with these guys, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you praise Joshua Dobbs, you get in trouble with one crowd. You we got this one guy on Twitter that claims that we never say anything negative about Mason Rudolph. You know, uh, look, <laughs> we don't have any skin in this game. You know, and you know what? Oh, you did watch every snap of Oklahoma State ever, though. So I don't know. You might have. Huh? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just messing. But, but I mean, go back and look at my tape study on, on, on Dobbs, too. I'm, you know, I fair, going, going, fair. You know I've, I've been fair on him. And I noted that, you know, the thing that I, that I remember noting the most about Joshua Dobbs and his college tape is his receivers dropped a whole hell of a lot of damn footballs. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and and that really affected his completion percentage overall. You know, there was a lot of that pit. There was a lot of that talk that that Dobbs isn't very wasn't very accurate in college. Now, what was he the most accurate quarterback? No, but but uh, the one thing that stuck out to me going through, uh, Alex, you remember how many damn you know I I how many damn snaps of his did I go through? I know I went through all of his last two years. Of yeah, tape, I'm just razzing. I'm tape, just razzing you. No, you we've know? been fair on. We talked about how bad Rudolph was the second week of camp. How bad he came down. And we, I think we've talked about the high 
highs and the lows of all these guys. People think that we have something to gain by our, by quote unquote our guy winning. Look, I mean, right from the get go, I I mean, I I'm more I was more impressed with the, with the college tape of Rudolph than I was Dobbs. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, and, and the other aspects, you go through the Parcells checklist of quarterbacks. It's hard to ignore that Rudolph, you know, is one of those guys, I think, that checked all the boxes or all of them but one. Or I forget what exactly what, what it was on that. I mean, the guy should be. Uh, and, you, and you got a third round pick in him and, and, and you claimed that he was a first round. You had a first round grade on him. you damn right. He should be the backup this year uh, and he should. And as we said all along, but he should win it fair and square. You know, he should he should outplay Dobbs and whoever else. And so far, I you know, I think he's doing it. Now he needs to continue doing it. You know, why why carry three quarter uh, three extra quarter? You know, in addition to Ben in, in camp, that's a good question. But I mean, Ben obviously has his days where A, he's got the half day, and B, he's got the the day off. So you you kind of like to have a three quarterback rotation when you can. Right? How many snaps is is Hodges getting when on on Ben full days? I could look. I don't know. I don't know for sure. He still got the fewest amount of attempts by any quarterback in camp by a, a decent margin. I mean, I'm so, guessing he's not getting a lot of work on days that Ben goes full in camp. Yeah, that that's fair to say. And on days that Ben goes half, whatever that is, you know. He probably yeah, gives, I, gives, I, I I'd have to look at the numbers, but yeah, obviously he's still been he's still been the number four. He's gotten some more situational work as he's played well, and they want to get some looks at him that they that say typical of a number four quarterback. My thought is just that you got a lot of good problems to have right now. You got enough. You got too many good quarterbacks. You got too many good receivers. Too many good offensive linemen. Too many good pass rushers. Throw in a couple corners, we got a party. I mean, like <laughs> they have a lot of good problems to 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 have come August, and and however it shakes out. Players are going to push each other, make each other better, and the Steelers are going to be better off for it no matter what they decide on. I know people probably probably, probably getting tired of talking talking about this quarterback situation, but one last thought. Look, I'm not I'm not going to uh, uh, put myself in the corner and say there's absolutely no way, you know, for for Hodges. But mm-hmm. man, I mean, I I got to see a lot more, and I think Dobbs really has to. <sighs> Yeah, I, I think Hodges really has to, to, to outplay. I think you have to get, once again, you have to get yourself in a position where you think Hodges is the better quarterback. Sure. No, I, and, agree. Yeah. I don't think you, I don't think you move on from Dobbs if you're not convinced Hodges is the better quarterback. I, I think that's silly. Now, look, you got, you have, uh, you have Dobbs under, under contract for this year and next year, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess the only only thing I would debate you on a little bit there, because obviously in principle you want to keep the better player. What if you got a trade offer for Dobbs and you thought that, okay, if you had to choose, Dobbs is a tiny bit better than Hodges, but you're getting a fifth round offer for Dobbs. Can you trade away the Dobbs for the fifth rounder and put Hodges there? Even though I, he's not I, the better. Will, I will tell you what Kevin Colbert would tell you. We're only going to do things that make our team better this year. Yeah, we know that's not always true. Well, because if I'm, there's a fifth, there's getting a fifth round pick and keeping Hodges make your team better. I think a lot of people uh, would argue yes. Well, I'm just saying, who's your better quarterback? If you're telling me that Hodges is a better quarterback, then yeah, you deal, you deal the, you, you deal, you deal Dobbs. All right, fair enough. Like I said, there's a long ways to go for this thing. No decisions have to be made today on August 13th, so you know we don't have to answer that today, and we'll let this thing play out. And look, like I said, <laughs> hold on because stranger things have happened. Things have a way of working themselves out. And, you know, I'm not. I'll just leave it at that. All right, Dave. Yeah, I think it's a good time to move on. That was a good discussion, though. I mean, I'm, I'm, we haven't had really taught that kind of discussion yet, and I'm glad we kind of got to, to take a step back and, and, and discuss it. Uh, Dave, you you had written about on the site for Monday about second year players. So many second year players that are in crucial situations for the Steelers right now. Starting roles, you know, sub package roles, and then maybe special teams roles. You went through kind of how those guys played on Friday. So how about you run through? all those second-year players and how they kind of did in their preseason debut. Yeah, and look, I mean, I had seven listed before this team went to training camp. Ter- uh, uh, Terrell Evans, Edmonds, James Washington, Chukwama Okorafor, Mason Rudolph, Marcus Allen, Jalen Samuels, and Ola Adain. Uh, 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 help me out there. Adaini. Adaini. Uh, yeah. Someone said instead of all nighty, it's all Daini. Uh, hey, whatever helps. <laughs> that, they said that's the way I need to start remembering. That's pretty good, though. Uh, instead of all ninety uh, or all ninety, uh, all uh, a Danny. 
Uh, all right, uh, let's start with uh, Edmonds. He didn't play much in that game. Uh, I thought the 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 key key thing with him, uh, he did give up you know early in the game, if, I, and I I really don't know why they charge guys for for giving up receptions on quick screens. I mean, it's not like you got to mm-hmm. break break it up. Uh, but regardless, okay, he allowed one reception for two yards. The 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 biggest uh, uh, thing that 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 bothered me about that play was was Edmonds missed the open field tackle. Yeah. Uh, uh, there. If you have anything really negative to say about Edmonds playing that that game, I would point to that. Uh, the pass breakup in the uh, end zone, uh, playing the pocket, driving that arm up through uh, the football and all. Great, great, great play by his single best play since he's been in the pros, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously that's been a short time. So uh, he, you know, he played. I think he played like 27 snaps. From what I've seen, and obviously we don't have all 22 to see. You know, everything that he's doing on the back end, I, I thought he played reasonably well. It was, he got to clean up that tackling, though. Uh, James Washington, I mean, what else do we need to say about him? I mean, the, 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 you go and look, everything this kid did, and there's a little bit of all 22 that snuck out uh, via uh, Brian Baldinger and, 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 and a breakdown that he did on him. <laughs> so I, I don't know about you, it's, it's hard to find anything that James Washington did wrong uh, in that game, starting with the, uh, you know, the, the deep reception down there, followed up by uh, no exactly where the chains was on that uh was a third and 20 or uh yeah third and 21 i mean he goes 22 yards runs that dig right across how them how them how, you know how that secondary let that happen uh mm-hmm. you know i i don't know but you know to his credit he found uh found the spot and 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 to dobbs credit nice uh nice pump fake and drill drilling that ball right in there uh you go into uh you go into uh you, you dig further into the back back shoulder route which he's worked with rudolph probably ten thousand times uh that was there uh even the catch that he didn't make uh, he almost got the two feet down in there uh, look at his blocking air in there the the big run by uh jalen samuels uh uh in, in late in the, around the second around the two minute warning of that game james washington and got him a two for one uh, on that. Once again, not much not to like about, uh, or not not to like about what James Washington did in that game. Now uh, it's a different story for a core four. I maybe you've gone a little bit deeper with him, but man, in 31 total snaps that I watched of him, kind of quickly, not overly impressive. He's penalized twice for holding in that game. Uh, you know, pass. I think he gave up. Uh, uh, maybe a maybe a hit or two in that game, uh, two two quarterback hurries, and he wasn't overly great in the, in, in in the run game as a run blocker either. So really kind of disappointing showing for him. We already talked enough about Mason Rudolph. I mean he was he was the best quarterback uh, the Steelers had on the field in my opinion Friday night. Marcus Allen. Really kind of, I mean, for, for 30 defensive snaps there, I mean, I know he had four tackles. Uh, he was seemingly targeted five times and allowed four receptions for 24 yards. Uh, I guess you could charge him for that for that late touchdown there. Uh, he had that tight end kind of uh, working and pushing back into the end zone. And, and, yeah, it was a bad throw, and the tight end made a hell of a damn uh, catch on that. But, you know, I don't think there's any way around not charging Marcus Allen for that one uh, overall, and really all four of his tackles came after pass reset, pass completions, uh, you know, down the field to, to whoever. So you know, it's hard to credit a guy for you know for doing his job and making tackles after receptions made. He did play 14 spe- special team snaps, uh, and I didn't notice anything good or bad stick out in in that phase. Jalen Samuels really didn't play a lot either. I think he had what eight offensive snaps. He touched the football three times for 30 yards. One of those was right at the at, at the start, which I think was a loss of a yard or something like that. Uh, he had another run for like 22 yards that we just talked about. That nice uh, nice block by uh, Banner and James Washington. Uh, on, on that side of the field help help spring that. I think he also had a reception for something like nine yards uh, later in the game. He played eight special team steps. Uh, he was flagged for holding on one of those punt returns. I think it was on the fair catch by uh, by Spencer early in the game. It's hard to really tell. You know, there were there were there were two number thirty eights on the field. <laughs> for that play, uh, Cameron Kelly was out, outside uh, working as a double, uh, double, double jammer. You know, it's hard to see whether or not they got you know, if the right 
38 got called there, you know, so uh, it's hard to get a, a guy for something uh, that you don't see there. So, you know, top to bottom, you know, hard, you know, Jalen Sanders, I thought he did fine. And, you know, uh, 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 Danny, you know, I thought he played fine uh, overall. Obviously, you'd like to see him get that sack when he had the pressure and forced uh, 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 Jameis Winston from the pocket early in the game. Uh, top to bottom, I, I thought he played just fine. And, you know, he even contributed some on special teams. I think he was officially credited with one solo and one assisted tackle uh, in that game. And that's something that we said prior prior to training camp getting started. That Boy, you know, we have a good feeling what 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 Ola can do as a pass rusher. Need to see him stick out and, 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 and you know, create even more of a worth of him by playing some on special teams. And I thought thought that he did that. So really, I think if you wanted to get picky here, a core four and Marcus Allen, you know, probably left a little bit to their play left a little bit to be desired there. But the rest of the five, I thought, represented himself good in that first preseason game. I'm, I'm with you, Dave. I think you summed it up well across the board. Uh, yeah, Danny playing special teams. I mean, that's huge for him. I talked to him over the summer, too, and he said that was one of the big things he was working on. Knew he had to come in and do all well there. Was really in tune with Danny Smith. Edmonds, I'm really excited about. He's had an awesome camp. I think all the snaps that he played last year is really paying off for this year, just being more comfortable, get to play faster and kind of match the time, speed, and the numbers he had coming out of Virginia Tech. Uh, core four, I mean, I did watch him pretty closely, but I did come to pretty much the same conclusion. I thought his hand placement was poor. He didn't have play with power. He's athletic. He gets to his spots quickly in his pass sets. But, uh, yeah, the power and, the, and his punch were, were really disappointing. And as I said before, I think Filer's all but got this right tackle job locked up. And then Allen was, was pretty quiet, too. Good tackler, but not seeing anything special about his game right now that's telling me this guy's uh, uh, got great odds to make the 53. Still could, still a ways to go, but uh, I think he's got to play a little, little bit better. I think you've gone a little bit deeper on Mondo than I have. What have you seen? Just athletic energy, pass rusher. Um, he gives you some pass rush, you know, juice. And I think to play defensive line in today's NFL, even in this 3-4 system that does more two-gapping than probably most teams, that you have to get after the quarterback. You can't be... You know, I know that we've talked about LeVon Hooks a lot and Keith Sales a lot, a lot, and LT Walton had brief value to this team. But if you're a one-dimensional clogger against the run, your upside's so limited. It's so hard to justify getting you on the field because, you know, back in the days when you were playing your 3-4 base 75% of the time and you were a big nose tackle or whatever, I mean, you know, you could have your one guy dedicated to stuff the run, the other guys that would do a little bit more pass rushing. You know, Aaron Smith wasn't a great pass rusher, but he had seasons where he's putting up eight and a half sacks or eight sacks, somewhere around there. But if you have, you know, with playing so much nickel today, you know, and, and teams able to throw the football any down and distance, you need guys that can, can get get after the quarterback. And so I think Mondo can do that a little bit, obviously if ways away from doing that on Sundays, but there's some potential there that Casey Sales and LeVon Hooks simply don't have. So I think just bringing some energy, some pass rush variety and some stuff like he hit that spin move on that right guard that got pressure <laughs> LeVon Hooks is never doing that. LeVon Hooks is uh, an 18-wheeler trying to do that spin move. It's taken him a year to do it. The same with Casey Sales. So there's just some juice the way that we're impressed with Isaiah Bugs because he's got hand use, he can d- disengage from blocks, and he can get after the quarterback as a pass rusher. So I think that element is, is required now for defensive linemen. I think Mondo shows a little bit of that. You know the first player that jumped in my mind uh, this afternoon when I was watching a, a little bit of Mondo? Who's that? Chris Hoke. <laughs> Ooh, all right, you can ask him. Hopefully get him on the show sometime here. You know, it just uh, – because we've seen Hoke Koki do that kind of spin yeah. move before, you know. And he was a guy that, that you know, uh, uh, you know played play more in, in the middle, obviously. But uh, uh, just there was there was, a, there was a, a, a moment or two where I thought, man, that kind of reminds me of Chris Hoke. Hoke there. <laughs> now, I wonder how you play against uh, stuff like the outside zone or whatnot. But, you know, I, I think you hit on it, though. You know, look, okay, could Chris Hoke play in – would Chris Hope get a roster spot in today's NFL? You know. Yeah, I think I think there was enough pass rush with him to do it. You know, so I mean, you definitely got to be. I mean, that's why LT Walton was not was more of a liability. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he was okay against the run. He could get them arms out there and 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 you know uh, hold hold the line and make a play against the run. But he just he couldn't get. You know, he 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 just was not a pass rusher. Uh, whatsoever, yeah. and you know, we'll we'll see if you know. Uh, one thing about Bugs that we saw was he was he was. I thought I thought Bugs was better against the run than he was as a pass rusher. I want to see it a little bit more. You thought? Uh, I, I, okay. Yeah, I mean, what did you see as a pass rusher overall on Bugs? 
I think just getting off the blocks, being tight on his stunts, being able to close. I thought against Duran there were some moments where he was okay, but I thought, you know, there were one or two double teams where he got washed out, which I get their double teams. I'll have to go back and be through it a little bit closer. My initial reaction, well— I, 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 I wasn't disappointed, but look, you know, this yeah. is a guy that I did that I that I tra- did all the sacks of, of, of the last two years sure. on, and, and all. So I I know I know he has the traits as a pass rusher. I just I don't think I saw kind of some of some of what I saw at Alabama in this in his in his few you know in his whatever fifteen pass or however many mm-hmm. he had uh, the other night. Uh, now he did he did I think on one of those twist stunts inside. I thought he did a good job uh, on 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 one of those. Though. But I mean, I'm I'm looking for him to. I'm not disappointed. Mm-hmm. You know I just want to see him build on that. Yeah, I mean, I thought he did a good job of staying clean. I should say with the run defense, there were really several, more than one positive moments where he was creating space, using his length to create space. And he was not a super long guy, but still just good, good punch, good placement and, and, and being able to have, you know, stack and shed, find the ball carrier, disengage your blocker and make the play. So there were really good positive moments in run defense in that regard. There were times where, though, where I thought he did get washed and pushed off the line where he wasn't able to, to stack and shed. Um, like that. He's got good hips. I know Carl Dunbar likes defensive linemen that have really good hips. They can kind of be able to squeeze in these gaps and get their body turned and hit these guys with these swim moves where they um, just are really kind of fluid and kind of unlock their hip. And I saw that once or twice with Isaiah Bug. So uh, I think there's really something there with him. Again, talking about the importance of pass rushing in the NFL and being a rotational guy, I think he can do that pretty early in his career. Uh, really impressed though by by Bugs and on, on in Friday's game. Yeah, and I really think there there's a, there's something to build on there. And I I saw one too that that he got washed out, kind of let himself yeah. get turned and and, right. and stay square, off. young fellow. Right, you got you get, look two, two things. You got to stay square to the line of scrimmage, and you can't be on the ground. You yep. know, amen. Uh, and I I don't remember seeing him on the ground much. I mean, he was held. Uh, he's held a couple times on, on on that first possession that he was in on. Uh, for the most part, though, I thought he was okay against the run. Yeah, you know, I just I want to see a little bit more as a pass rusher moving forward. And we look, he's going to get plenty of opportunities, I think, move, moving forward with him. Yeah, Greg Gilmore, sneaky, decent game, end of the game. Check out some of those goal line snaps. I thought Gilmore did well. Still not a fan of him, but uh, run defense was was good at the very end of that one. Uh, Devin Bush, boy, the more you get into his tape, and especially the all 22 views, <laughs> the, the, that guy's going to be starting week one, Alex. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, you know, I, right. I think it's going, I think, I think it very well is going to be, you know, a combination of him and Vince and him and Baron. And I think, I think, uh, him and Baron going to allow you to do a lot more stuff that you want to. God bless Vince. But, uh, I, I, I just think, Bush is going to be hard to keep off the field, and and you know I've said that for quite a while now. Don't be surprised if he, I I don't see. I mean, show me an instance unless he's unless he doesn't know the scheme, you know, and he's got three more weeks to go to to learn and put more of this stuff in in in, in into practice here. I just don't see how you pull him off the field, man. I mean, yeah, I hear you. If he has the green dot, he ain't coming off the field, and that's the goal. Do I mean, that sooner than can, later. And I think your 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 uh your hesitation all along was can he can he communicate can he call it? Yeah, but so far, I mean, from what Tomlin says, I know he might sugarcoat it a little bit. So far, so good. So if he can do that, sky's the limit for a snap count. Even if he's close, come week one, man, I'll I'll, I'll risk it. You know, week one might be tricky just because it's New England and it's on the road. That might be a little dicey, but yeah, I I mean, I hear what you're saying. You want to get him as, on the field as much as possible. For sure, and he yeah. will be. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you know, the, the more you get into this kid, and I mean, you, you try to take your fan hat off and you try to look at this objectively. <laughs> I think he's got a, I think he's got a shot to win Defensive Rookie of the Year. I, I, I really do. Who was the better inside linebacker in that game the other night? Young inside linebacker, him or White? Well, I'm sure Steeler fans White, will White, say White, Devin Bush. White, and White, White didn't play much, right? I think he had only one tackle, but I'm sure Bucks fans will say Devin White and Steeler fans will say Devin Bush. I, I mean, mean I, I thought Bush was good, and that's all I care about. I don't care about Devin White. How many how many snaps did Devin White play? I know I think he played a lot less. Okay, uh, yeah, I think he only had one official tackle. Uh, Dave, when they go to Foxborough, we'll eleven play. eleven snaps for Devin White. That it. Mm. All right. Well, I don't know. Bush Bush played really well. When they go to Foxborough week one. When the Steelers are in their nickel defense for the first time, they're two, four, five. Who are the two inside linebackers on the field? I'm going to say Devin Bush and Vince Williams. First snap of the game. First time they go nickel, I should say. Or base, I guess. Yeah, you know, I mean. Get my question. 
I'll, I'll go to the other side just to go to the other side. All right. I mean, you, you, you've seen them more than I have out, out there. I mean, I, I think it's yet to be determined. You know, I, I, look, you lose something with Vince out there. I mean, he plays great downhill. Don't get me wrong. And he always has. But you lose something off the ball, you know. Well, I think that's the benefit of Bush is you have one guy that can make those plays and maybe Vince can't. And you keep Vince's communication, which I think is really critical why he played so much last year versus the Patriots, run defense and blitzing. Is also important. And I don't think he's the coverage liability that people think he is. He's not Devin Bush, but he's not, you know, this this terrible athlete that can't move at all. A good problem to have, I think. Yeah, I can. More good problems to have. That's the that's the overall thought. Any other thoughts on this game before you want to jump to some reader emails? Uh, any other thoughts from from rewatching this? No, thing? I I think we 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 tore it up pretty good. I think more than anything, and and, and you know, I I keep saying this. This boy sure was an entertaining first preseason game, and I know we've been chomp, chomping at the bit for for uh, some football here, but I, I just can't remember being. This excited, this prepared, uh, this happy with, with everything that that I saw. Yeah, offense put up 30 points. Gives you a lot to talk about in a good way. So, obviously, the secondary was pretty poor. But, I mean, they had so many new guys. Ponder, two practices. Mathis didn't practice at all, and they're putting him out there. Like, they had to run such vanilla stuff. And that might have hurt Justin Lane, maybe even, too, where he's got to play so much off coverage and so much zone. I'm curious maybe what the game plan is. Not that they're going to game plan it super heavy, but I wonder if they're going to change the play calls any – any different for week two now that their secondary is kind of, you know, practiced, which is always helps. So I don't know how that's going to go, but I, right. we'll, we'll see from Lane. All right, let's, uh, let, let's get to some emails here. And in fact, one of our own writers, Josh Carney, longtime contributor of the site, writes and says, hey, guys, sorry to bring up uh, Antonio Brown again. But uh, if he truly does sit out the season due to his helmet fiasco and has to forfeit money back, would the uh, let me open this up all the way? Uh, would the Steelers get a break for the dead money? Uh, no, that, that dead money became dead the moment they traded him. So nothing that happens with the Raiders at this point will affect anything related to the dead money related to the, the, to what the Steelers had, uh, when, when they traded away Antonio Brown, that's that, you know, that, 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 that's all behind them now. Nothing, nothing changes it at this point. Uh, Jeff Burton. Do you, you want to talk about the AB situation at all? Is there an appetite for that? I mean, I'm indifferent, but do you yeah, want to... I mean, look, I, I just think it's, I think it's crazy. And I think, man, uh, remember, <laughs> oh, here comes Dave. <laughs> I told you so. All right, let me, let me get ready. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. oh, remember, remember Dave telling you that he was, uh, don't be surprised if both those guys, Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell both get one and done. Uh, in their new cities. I feel like I'm about halfway there already, and, and the 2019 season hasn't even started. Uh, what what a head case this guy has been. And, you know, right from the get-go, I said, uh, man, I'm I, you know, uh, take take your hat off and hand it to Kevin Colbert for getting a third and a fifth. Are you kidding me? Uh, he, he found somebody to, 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 to give him a third and a fifth for Antonio Brown? Who who looks who looks like the who looks like they got rook now? Yeah, I think Oakland's learned never trade for a Steelers wide receiver ever again. <laughs> so, I, there, there's two as things you said, that, right? Oh, don't don't buy a used car from Kevin yeah. Colbert either. <laughs> two things I'm not doing when when I'm dealing with Kevin Colbert. I'm not I'm not trading uh, for one of his wide receivers. I'm not buying a used car from him. Yeah, uh, yeah. E- e- either way here. Look, I mean, obviously we'll see how this all plays out, but man. Uh, and, and and Antonio Brown's a great wide receiver, man. Uh, there, I will never forget some of the things he did in Pittsburgh. But man, the further you get away from this, you start to really wonder how much the old addition by subtraction, blah blah blah. Uh, you know, think think. Uh, I tell you what, I, I bet if Mike Mayock had the opportunity to to get a do over right now, he'd do over. Yeah, they're probably looking at each other, Mayock and Gruden, going, "What the heck did we get ourselves into?" Now I will say. To answer Josh's question, I'm sure most people know the news by now. AB appeal for the helmet was rejected, predictably most obvious decision in the world. But he said he's going to play this year. The whole threat and retirement, threat and retirement does not seem to be happening. And maybe by week one, things will blow over. But it is always going to be a question of when's the next thing going to come up. And kudos to Mike Tomlin for keeping it together for as long as they did. Because Gruden hasn't been able to do it for months. And, and Tomlin did it for years. So maybe that tells you about how good of a coach each guy is. This is not going to be the last time. We're, mm-hmm. we're we're talking about him. And we knew that when the Steelers traded them him to Oakland. We knew that this stuff was going to 
come up. It wasn't there might have been a honeymoon phase, maybe longer honeymoon phase than what ended up transpiring, but it was not gonna be a paradise for forever. Can you imagine if their season gets off to a rough start? And and and, 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 and you know, also, and I know people are already tired of us talking about this, but I mean you need training camp to work out some of these things and he's not he's not practicing. Sure, it's gonna hurt him. Absolutely it's gonna hurt the whole offense. They gotta get in sync, absolutely. You know, what happens if that team starts off Zero oh, and three or whatever. What then? What's his attitude going to be? You know? No, yeah, not my problem. Not our problem. Thank right. goodness. So uh, yeah. anyway, let's move on from that. Okay. Next uh, email. Uh Jeff Berg writes in. No, no play clock at, at camp. I've heard y'all say multiple times that there's no play clock in practice at camp, and thus the delay of game by Hodges could be understood to a degree. My question is, why are why in why in tarnation isn't there a play clock at camp? How can you prepare for a game scenario with no play clock in practice? I'm guessing Bill Belichick has one in camp, which brings to mind how their first preseason game went 31-3, to something against a former defensive coordinator who should know how to handle them. I know it's preseason, but still. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure there isn't a play clock. The scoreboard's always tilted away. But it's not like they stand around for 30 seconds and let Hodges do whatever he wants to do. I mean, they still get it off pretty quickly. I'm just, I was just trying to make the point of the things that you have to deal with inside a stadium that you don't really have to deal with as much in a practice. You know, crowd noise is different. Being away from the, being more than five feet from your offensive coordinator is different. The play clock situation, running the whole show by yourself. So I was just trying to illustrate one minor point about the differences and some of the new learning experiences that a rookie quarterback is going to have to deal with. But I don't think it's an issue that you might be making it out to be. All right, this one from John Fletcher, John Fletcher, and it's about Ryan Switzer. This was the one that I prepped you for mm-hmm. earlier in the show here. What's up, guys? I was wondering why y'all have so so much. What is all these y'alls all of a sudden, man? I feel like I'm back home. <laughs> y'all, y'all is a sudden thing. Uh, mm-hmm. From from where I'm from, right? Last couple of emails, I got a couple of y'alls in there. I was wondering why y'all, where where's What's uh what what do y'all what do you guys say over there? You, you, you y- yins? Y- yins guys. Oh yeah, yins. That's Steelers. Yeah, that's that's a Steelers y'all. Uh, I was wondering why y'all have so much doubt about Switz making the fifty three. I know y'all are still leaning towards him making it more than not, but he has proven to be reliable as a wide receiver. When looking at last year's Denver game, he caught literally, literally everything and did so while while taking massive hits. Also, his poor return game I think is more due to Danny Smith. Considering the fact that every year of college and then in Dallas, his rookie year, he always had at least one return for a TD. Also, Big Ben clearly loves him, especially with that report coming out about him texting him during the Super Bowl. He has a rapport with Ben, and Ben likes him. He's definitely making the team. Look, we don't – we both – I at least – you had, is Switch going to be on your next 53 or no? Yes, he is. All right. Switch is on my latest 53. However, like I said, I'm not ready to write all that stuff in pen. And I think I've said this several times during the offseason. And yes, he did have that one game where he was able to go, you know, to catch the balls down the field. But outside of that, it's not, that's not his game in the NFL level. That's not, in my opinion, something you're going to get out of him uh, week after week. I think his average, his, his average depth of target that we went over earlier in the season. Uh, what, 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 do you remember why I say two or three yards or something like that? I mean, I think that's who he is as a receiver as a whole. I don't think he's much of anything to line up out and out of the backfield to do, you know, to do some of the things that, 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 that have been done in Dallas and, and that the Steelers tried to do last year. Uh, I, I, I don't see what's special about him that people say, Proven to be a reliable as a wide receiver. I, I'm just not saying. To me, he is just a guy that that can return kicks right now. So uh, I think Eli has more upside as a receiver than Ryan Switzer. Uh, Switzer obviously probably the better kick return guy of the two. They both can, although you know we haven't seen Eli really do it much of any lately. Return. You know, as a return guy, maybe we will at some point during the offseason. But, you know, and and look, he's not going to give you on any other portion outside of playing some limited slot 
stuff, and as a kick returner, punt returner, uh, that that's about all you're going to get out of him, I think. And you know, I, that's why we talk a little bit more about Hilton, uh, especially if Rodgers makes it as potentially being that sixth guy because he he can wear a lot of, a lot of different hats for you as well. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as we both have him on the 53, then, you know, I don't know what the big complaint is. Uh, Their number five and number six receivers for spots are always going to be in question when they're battling with so many other receivers out there. But I I think that Dave and I both say that these guys, it's fair to say that Rodgers and Switzer are both more likely to make the roster than not make the roster, right? Would you agree with that? Say it again. I know, the third train going, it's just... Unbelievable. Uh, it's more likely that Rodgers and Switzer both make the roster than not make the roster, right? Yeah, I would. I would still. I would. I would still be on that side. Yeah. Okay. I mean. I mean. That's yeah. why. That's why I have both of them on my fifty-three yeah. still. Yeah. So like, I don't know. I think. I think we're more than fair about evaluating these guys and saying that you know, if we if neither of us had Switzer on the fifty-three, then maybe you could yell at us for it. But I think we're just talking about options because if if you and I'm not talking to you, Dave, but just Steelers Nation in general, believe in my premise that the fact that Eli only played five snaps Friday means that he's got a pretty good shot to make the team. Not 100%, but a pretty good shot to make the team. Then there's only one receiver spot left, and you're going to have some good competition with Spencer. You know what I realized, Dave? Spencer's numbers, I know they return stuff, you know, could have been better, but he averaged, I think, 30 yards a kick and like 13 yards a punt. Those are good numbers for a return guy in his first ever game, uh, first game as a Steeler, I should say. So, uh, you know, if you want to, if, if Eli's secure as the five or pretty secure and you got Switzer as a six, you got guys battling for it, then of course you're going to occasionally talk about Switzer's spot and is it in jeopardy or at least entertain the idea of how does a Johnny Holton make the roster? How does a Deontay Spencer make the roster? And then by extension, whose spot does he take? So I think we've been fair about it. I, I think Switzer has. The, the value of being the kick and punt returner. And, and I think that I agree that, you know, Switzer's return issues were not all his fault last year. I think I went through it pretty thoroughly and, and talked about issues with Danny Smith and talked about issues with the blocking team and talked issues about the systemic problems that this team has in the return game in general, and my frustrations with Mike Tomlin and, and, and how he approaches the return game. So I'm giving a long an answer here, but as long as we both have Switzer on the 53, then I'm not sure what more you want from us. I, it's not, 100% lock. We're going to talk about you know what happens to, to possibly change him from from losing that spot. Look, are you are you going to be clutching your pearls if uh, either Switzer or or Rogers does not make it? No. I mean, in other words, are you know you're not going to be shocked, right? No, there might be some frustration about Switzer in the return game, but no, I'm not going to be. Rogers, I might be pretty. Surprised you're not. You're not going to be shocked. I mean, uh, if we're sitting here saying, "Oh my God, can you believe both of them didn't make it?" I mean, it'd be surprising if neither of them made. I'm pretty sure well, one ne- of them. Right. Is- if neither, it would be a shock. Yeah. I'm saying if one of them doesn't okay. make it. Yeah. No, it wouldn't I mean, be. I, I think we'd be out of our mind to suggest right now that neither of them make it. Yeah. No, at least one of them is going to make it. Right. But, I mean, what, and, and, uh, I just, what I just said, I mean, you wouldn't be shocked if one of them doesn't. Right. Yeah, right. I agree. I would not be shocked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I did, did people really... I, I just, on it, which is I, fine. I'm not I, mad about it. It just surprised me. There, the blowback from some of it. I, I, I just don't. Uh, I don't know. No. Right. Uh, okay. What else? <laughs> uh, what else do we have here? Pastor Joe Green writes in, "Hey, gentlemen, great job on coverage. I truly enjoy the show and the site. I have a question as follow: What's up with Baron wearing number 26? I know he wore 26 with the Rams, but that was after being drafted as a safety and transitioning to linebacker. According to the NFL, numbers in the 20s are reserved for DBs and running backs, not linebackers. How did the Steelers make this work?" I guess they got an exception. I think the league's become more okay with it. Dion Buchanan was wearing 20s in Arizona. I know he was another guy that transitioned. Uh, Tart in San Francisco was doing it. I I guess the the NFL okayed it, I guess. Uh, it might be one of those grandfather things. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to go back and look at that. It might be one of those grandfather thing, grandfathered in things, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but either way, it, he's wearing it. So Yeah, I mean, they, they obviously matters. wouldn't. I mean, if, if he couldn't wear it, then he wouldn't be wearing it. You know, yep. uh, I, I don't know what what more to tell you other than that there. Uh, all right. I, I think we've gone kind of kind of deep enough into this thing here. And we'll let's see one more from uh, Julio Salgada here. Hi, guys. Like uh, like always. Thank you for the great work. Just catching part of the Cowboys 49ers game and made me think uh, think of a left field question since I know Dave loves hypotheticals. <laughs> so would you rather have Vander Esch? 
and Savage or other top safety from this year without trading up or what we have with with Edmonds Bush combo. I mean, geez, I mean, ah, uh, look, I mean, all, I I haven't watched. I don't. Did Savage even play in the Packers' first preseason game? I don't think he did. I didn't. Did he? I didn't watch it. So I mean, I, sure. obviously Van Der Esch has been a good fit over with the Cowboys and all like that. But I mean. I, I, I'm okay with what they have. I'm excited where yeah. everything's going to go, and I'm excited about Bush. And I like Van Der Esch, but I'm going to just stamp that. I, I am too, but I think it's more of I've moved on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think about those draft things too much. I, I just I, don't. I, I move on. I, yeah, I mean, I mean, am I am I monitoring Savage's career? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean that that's one of the guys that I, I I look forward to tracking. You know, along with Van Der Esch as well too. I thought I think he's played well so far uh, as well. But I mean. Uh, but Bush had a great first game, and hopefully, that hopefully he's the guy. You know, it looks like yeah. look like they made the right choice there. You All want right. to talk about Cowboys linebackers? It should be Steeler Sean Lee. I know he's been injured, but he was supposed to be a Steeler. Tomlin took Jason Rolls over him, so talk yeah, about that. You want to talk about a Cowboys linebacker? Should be Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, that that seems like eons ago now. Mm-hmm. Okay, in the meantime, uh, Alex and I will be back together, of course, after the Tuesday training camp practice. Uh, check SteelersDepot.com out Tuesday after Mike Tomlin talks. We'll try to recap everything that he had to say. Some more film breakdowns coming from the Buccaneers game as we start working toward getting ready for the game against the Chiefs as well. A lot of great stuff on the site uh, as of late. Guys are really, really doing a great job. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex uh, uh, on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and you want to donate to the cause, a lot of, lot of, uh, 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 donations lately uh, go to steedersdepot.com hit the donate button up right navigational bar or if you want an ad free version of the site and, and look we had a recent problem with one of the uh, one of the ad companies having some sort of pop up uh, redirect in there from time to time that stuff's going to happen we were on it as soon as we could there really wasn't anything we could do about it until the ad company took care of it on our end so if you got caught up on and it's, I think it's mostly happened to iPhone users uh, who use Safari uh, uh, who, who had that for about a 24-hour period there. We, 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 we apologize for that. One way to guarantee that you don't have those sort of issues is getting the ad-free version of the site. And to do that, you can go to SteedersDepot.com and hit the ad-free button up right navigational bar for $25 for one calendar year. You can get an ad-free version of the site. So uh, with that, like I said, Alex and I will be back on Tuesday evening to recap what he observed at training camp practice earlier in the day. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.